Famous chefs or celebrity chefs. Those whose culinary skills as trained professional chefs has garnered celebrity status through television and other mediums. The first American celebrity chef is credited as Julia Child, who first appeared on television in 1963. After starring in her show, The French Chef, and publishing multiple cookbooks, she's left her mark on the culinary world by demystifying the art of cooking at home while also paving the way for many other celebrity chefs. My name's Anthony Padilla, and today I'm gonna be sitting down with famous chefs to learn what it's really like to have your every move in the kitchen dissected and scrutinized by millions of people. Do these chefs find true fulfillment in devoting their entire life to cooking and inventing recipes for millions to see and judge? Or are the ever-growing pressures of this hectic and demanding industry far too overwhelming for them to achieve any sense of true happiness? Hello, Kat. Hey, Anthony, how are you? Duff. Good to see you, man. Judy Jew. Hey. Thank you so much for coming on here and teaching me about the world of being a famous chef. Absolutely. So what do you consider yourself? Celebrity chef, uh, culinary expert? A chef that, you know, has been able to do, uh, to, you know, break some glass ceilings. I love to cook food and it just so happens that you know, every once in a while, I get to do it for millions of people. Celebrity chef, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I always say I'm not really yeah. famous. I'm fame-ish, like a little <laughs> bit. What does being a famous chef entail? These days, it's not just about cooking, you know? I mean, like, you obviously cook, but you have the restaurants, you have the books, you got the TV show, you got appearances. How, how high on the list do you think making and preparing food actually is. That's fundamental. That's that's first thing. That's what you have to do first. That's like the foundation, yeah. I guess, you know, that's yeah. what you build on. How long have you been a chef? 95. I graduated from Culinary Institute of America. 25 years then. Yeah, about 20, 25 years. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Seven, eight years ago, yeah. I've been cooking since I was 14. Uh, my first job was at McDonald's. From McDonald's? to celebrity chef. See, right? anyone can do it. I think McDonald's is one of the most important places I work. Think about McDonald's, they like teach you like all the stuff that nobody else has like the time to teach you. Like, yeah. you know, cause restaurants are like super busy. Consistency in cooking is really, really important. Yeah. And McDonald's really like kind of drills that into you. What type of food are you most well known for? I'm known for modern Korean um, takes on, on, on traditional Korean food. I would say probably Mediterranean. That's really, you know, my soul food. I think cakes, right? Yeah. You know, I make like, you know, big crazy cakes that, you know, look like stuff or, you know, sometimes they have special effects. They have lasers in them. And or smoke something and exploding smoke. in them. You you literally made a cake when, uh, when, when we uh, hit 1 billion views at Smosh and we yeah. exploded the cake. <laughs> I loved it. Can you recall the first moment that you realized you loved to make food and that was something that you potentially could see yourself doing for a long time. I grew up in a town called Sandwich. That's and, uh, why you're a chef. You could have just said that. <laughs> the interview's done. Interview's done. We know the whole story. So I grew up in a town called Sandwich. Yeah. And I worked at this restaurant called Sandwich Pizza. <laughs> so uh, I was working there uh, at Sandwich Pizza and I was getting ready to go to undergrad and my brother had come up and he's like, hey, make me a steak and cheese. And I was like, sure. So I like got the meat and I put it on the griddle and I was sitting there and I was like chopping up the meat and the whole time I was doing it, I was like having a conversation with my brother. There was like a second, like I sort of like looked down and saw that like my hands were just like doing this thing like by themselves while I was completely thinking and talking about something else. Yeah. And I was like, huh, you know, I'm good at this. Maybe I should be a chef. I was always like kind of obsessed with it. And I just found it to be so incredibly interesting. And, and, and the lure of the kitchen was just, you know, compelling. The thing I find so fascinating about food is there, there are so many elements to it. The texture and the flavor and the presentation. And there's so many different styles and there's so many different cultures and, and I love exploring cultures through food. I mean food tells a story and the history of a country. It's really incredible yeah. to see and to learn about a culture and a country through the lens of food. For clarification's sake, can you explain the difference between a cook and a chef? When you're actually like cooking in a professional kitchen for customers, I think maybe that would be the line. Whereas like a cook, you're just doing it at home and you're not running a profit and loss 
team in, I guess. You, know, I don't know. you got like a team uh-huh, of minions uh-huh. working for you. Then you're a chef. <laughs> you got you people to people boss below around. You. you got people to uh-huh. boss around. <laughs> then, then you're a chef. Do you think there are any specific character traits that are needed to become a chef at you know at such a celebrated caliber? I think you have to do very well under pressure. That's number yeah. one. A great multitasker. You have to be able to organize your thoughts really quickly. Essentially, you're performing while you're directing, while you're managing all at once. And if you mess up, someone will tell you. Exactly. You're running, a, <laughs> you're producing a Broadway show every single night. At this point, do your friends and family expect you to always make something for them? In the beginning of, you know, when I was real, when I really became a chef, the expectation was, well, you know, hey, Kat's here. Yes. You need to know someone with a pickup truck because you got to move sometimes. You got to know a massage therapist because you got to get your massage down for free sometimes. And you got to have someone cook chef's food for you every once in a while. I agree, I agree. Before we learn more about the world of famous chefs, I just want to take a quick moment to acknowledge that having access to food, especially tasty food, is a privilege that many people don't get to consistently enjoy. And If you're in the mood and you've got even a couple dollars to spare, it it would be very cool if you could check out and consider donating to one of the many food banks in your local area or around the world, like Feeding America or World Food Program. I'll drop some links down in the description below if you're interested. That's all I wanted to say. Now back to learning about the world of famous chefs. Do you always prepare gourmet, picture-perfect food for yourself, even when you're at home? No. <laughs> Most of my dishes are like deli containers. Like, I don't just like leftovers. No, there's not leftovers. I like, I buy these. <laughs> no way. Not not even close. Like I'll take a bag of yeah. instant noodles, put like some fresh veggies and like pimp them out a bit, you know, but sometimes I just eat ice cream for dinner. Like I love ice cream. <laughs> I feel like people commonly have this perception that sh- chefs are always making something gourmet and fancy. No, not at all. As pre-made food and food delivery services have become more and more widespread, do you feel like cooking and accompanying traditions are going extinct with modern generations as we become less and less apt to cook our own food? You know what? I would have said yes about three months ago, but COVID has regenerated everybody into cooking. A lot of people I know (laughs) have turned to more and more food delivery during the pandemic and it's actually going the opposite way. People are stressed out about so many different things that you know, many people I know are just like, I can't even bother cooking right now. It is kind of sad because that's you know, kind of our, our link to our past, our ancestors in a way. Yeah, I think that um, food again, you know, tells so much of a story and the memory surrounded by, by food. I think mm-hmm. it's just like, you know, when you taste something, it's just one of those triggers you know I, I, have you seen that movie ratatouille yes ratatouille yes right? you know when he takes that one bite and all of a sudden like zoom, he's like a little boy food is so powerful when you smell it when you taste yeah. it when you you're like oh my god this is this reminds me of when i was here whatever or w- w- with my grandmother or my mom's cooking or something it is so incredibly powerful and transporting it is it's it's so important do you think it's important for cooking to be taught in school people should be taught how to cook one just so you, you like gain a a, a a bigger appreciation for it you know just for like the fact that like wherever you go you know wherever you eat somebody's making you something when they can visually see the ingredients that are going in yeah i think if a lot of people saw how much salt professional chefs put in food they would be concerned. (laughs) (laughs) To say the least, yeah. If there's anyone watching who doesn't particularly enjoy cooking, but, you know, is interested in doing more of it and hopefully enjoying it someday, is there anything that you'd want to say to them? It's just a matter of having the patience to learn how and not being scared. I think that a lot of people just have this fear factor and it's just getting over the fear factor. And I've cooked with some of my girlfriends, like, you know, we're like, we were making chili and the recipe said 12 tomatoes and she had like 13 and she didn't want to put the last one uh-huh. in. I was like, put the 13 tomatoes. I was like, just put it. It doesn't like, matter. It says 12. I, it says dozen, not baker's dozen, I know. okay? <laughs> he wants to be with his friends. Reunited. I know for me, uh, I've had moments where I was, I was scared of wasting ingredients because I'm like, I don't, wanna, I don't know if I want to try this new recipe. What if I don't do it right? What if I waste the ingredients? What if I have to throw the whole thing out? But 
I, th I think it's definitely worth just putting the time in and just trying something out. Because if it's different than the recipe, then it's your own and then it's your own thing. Totally, and if you yeah. like it, it's a success, it doesn't matter. Why do you think the world of chefs in general is so male dominated? It's interesting because the history of how most males learn how to cook doesn't line up with the fact that there's more men in the industry than women. Because most male cooks, even the best in the world, will tell you, I learned how to cook from my mother, my aunt, and my grandmother. True. It's not necessarily the long hours, but the fact that you finish so late. Like, I've had some um, women workers who were just concerned about taking the, the night bus at two in the morning, you know, because right. it's not a safe yeah. time to travel. So there's safety issues around this, you know, and like, mm -hmm. yeah, so I, it's just not, um, you know, uh, it's just not a friendly environment for women for a few different reasons. Nikki wants to know what the worst injury is that you've ever received on the job. You see like the tip of my... Oh yeah, yeah you see how it's like... It's a little mound. I chopped the tip of my thumb off. Oh. I was working at this restaurant and the chef came over and I was like, yeah, I gotta go to the hospital. He was like, you're not going anywhere. And he he dug through the food that was on the, the cutting board and found the piece oh. and stuck it back on and wrapped it up with duct tape and I had to keep working. <laughs> <laughs> I do not think that would fly now. Does that kind of stuff still happen? I, yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. And then it grew on perfectly fine. You could barely tell. I couldn't even it, barely notice. I was cutting like plastic wrap and I sliced Just like all the ancillary thumb. stuff that you do as a chef. Yeah, and I was cutting, I was like being lazy trying to cut plastic wrap and I like sliced yeah. my thumb open. But I was so busy, I like just like wrapped it up with tape just to stop the bleeding. So I did this like gnarly like blue tape wrap around my thumb. And then finally when I got home at like one in the morning, I remember I was like, I gotta can deal with this, right? You're like, oh, this is a lot worse than I thought it was. Well, I was in London, and in London, like, they do this, like, house call service. It's very common. It's, like, old school. Like, you just, doctors just, like, come over. America, it's, where yeah. are you at? I, house <laughs> call services? And then I have a white counter, and he's, like, unwrapping it, and it just, like, spurts blood everywhere. Oh, no. And you just went through the night working with that? It was just like blood mm. everywhere. Muslihah wants to know what you think about the future of food, given the reality of climate change. Oh, so this is why we should all become vegans, actually. <laughs> the number one contributor to um, greenhouse gases is actually the agricultural um, industry. I love fish. I love to eat fish, but we're, it's just, it's a lot and we've got to slow it down. We are crushing our planet with our meat production. It is insane. It's kind of a political issue, you know, because all of the lobbyists for the beef industry, the chicken industry, all this stuff are, are, are just way too strong to actually promote people not to eat consume meat. Yeah. There are hundreds of thousands of problems with, with how we're treating the environment. I think we can put a dent in a few of them if we can really start looking at, you know, other ways that uh, we can eat. I feel like that's multi-layered because it's, it's the lobbyists, it's the huge factories, it's the huge companies, but then also there's that extra added layer of tradition and culture that many people would not feel comfortable removing themselves from. It's interesting. I, I think that the whole vegan movement is, is growing, but um, I don't think it's going to be mainstream for a long time in terms of the majority of the population. I don't see turning vegan, um, not, not for a while. The planet is fine. We're not. And, you know, we'll, we'll be gone and the earth will eventually heal itself because it's what it, you know, it's what the earth does. If octopi were allowed to live for 40, 50, 60 years, they would be the dominant species on this planet. We would be screwed. That's true? Oh, because that they don't need true. thumbs because they have their, their their dangly bits that, that can- Dude, they have like, yeah. they have like thumbs times infinity, but they only live for like a year. Wait, that's still in their Yeah, they're insanely smart. Alex wants to know if people actually have to clean dishes if they can't cover their bills. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we don't make people do that, but that's a good idea. That's always something you see in cartoons. <laughs> I, would, 
I would never make anybody do that. No, I mean, I might make them come back there and learn how to cook a little bit. And like, what is it about being a celebrity chef that brings you the most joy? I love making new recipes. Like, I love creating new recipes and new dishes and food. Like, that's the creme de la creme. Knowing that I, I was some small way like. You know, helping somebody like like physically do something, yeah, create something. Yeah, you're inspiring. Yeah, you know that feels really good. Food critiquing session. All right, here we go. I would love for you to teach me how to review some food that that you may have made. My wife prepared myself a dish here, grilled salmon here. You can see that. Ooh, those grill marks are flawless. So I made uh, some really old school pokey. Pokey! My fish tank guy brought me some tuna. <laughs> I've got my Korean fried chicken. That looks incredible. Mm, you gotta have a little cabbage on the side. Exactly. Always. A little, and we also have a little <laughs> bit of pickled daikon on the side, which you eat between oh bites. Oh my god, you made so much. <laughs> I didn't make it, my minions made it. I, I told people to make this. Today I have prepared vegan mac and cheese from a box. Oh, pretty complicated, but you know, it did take three minutes. So a lot of time and energy went into this. I feel passionate about it. Is that in a cake pan? This is, I don't know. This is just some kind of ceramic black thing. Does it look like a cake pan? Yeah, it looks like a cake pan. And not everything's about cake. Okay, cake guy. <laughs> 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 Can you uh, teach me how you would critique a dish and then I will attempt to do so with my own dish? Taste, originality, it was presentation, it was technique, and there was what, what inspired the dish. The idea behind it is just as important as any of the other four elements there. Taste is number one. Oh, taste is number that, one. Sell that vegan mac and cheese to me. I mean, I think that it brings my personality in here. We got the vegan, we got the cheese, you know, got some bright colors here, contrasting with each other, the texture. Absolutely flawless. Is it good enough? It is good. You know, good. if I if I were to go all out, I would have went on top of it, I would have added some vegan Parmesan shreds, vegan Parmesan Ooh. powder. I would have thrown in all the different types of cheese that I could find. You, you <laughs> want to get luxury with your vegan mac and cheese? Yeah. Shave some truffles on it. Hold on, let me go get my uh, truffle pig real quick and I'll go find go some find in, in the local the forest. forest. I'll be right back. I actually have a parting gift for you. The oh. best interviewer shirt here in the inverted color to what you see here. You could get this at padildoshop.com, but for you, Judy Jew, I will ship this to you for free. I love it. And you're wearing it right now. It looks incredible on you. Thank you. I can't <laughs> wait. All right, you got five seconds to shout out or promote anything you want directly in the camera. Go. Follow me at Kat Cora on Instagram. Go to my website, catcora.com, and check out my charity, Chefs for Humanity. This September, I have a brand new book coming out. It's called Super Good Baking for Kids. It's good for kids, but it's actually good for everybody. Hi everyone, I'm Judy Ju. I just opened up my new restaurant called Soulbird in the Westfield Shopping Center in Shepherd's Bush in London, so check me out there. Hey everybody, subscribe to Anthony Padilla. What's wrong with you now? Right from the Iron Chef's mouth, straight into your face. Thank you so much, Duff. I feel like I understand the world of being a famous chef just a little bit more. <laughs> awesome, you know, it's a, it's a strange place to be. After spending the day with these famous chefs, I've come to understand just how much creative energy really goes into inventing and preparing recipes for so many people to enjoy and learn from. Having your art judged based on creativity, appearance, and flavor is difficult enough, but doing so while under the intense microscope of stardom is no small feat. See you later, bye guys. That's a like! Trashy um, is my sour cream and onion Pringles potato chips. <laughs> I love just the fact that you're like, you know, a celebrity chef with the Pringles too. Like I like, ah, I can eat that entire, that entire can, that stack of Pringles. Oh, yeah. So good. Do you look at your Pringle and see which side has the most flavor on it and make sure that side is a side that touches your tongue? True, I do, because that white powder. It's a necessity. They've thought about this. That white powder is a drug. It's the engineering behind the Pringles potato chip. Some very smart scientists out there did a lot of testing. I mean, whenever you go to a hotel and you get that mini can, Oh, yeah, I always yeah. eat it. <laughs> I can't, I can't like resist. I'm like, oh, I kind of wish that this entire video we would just talk about Pringles. Pringles. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else I was gonna talk about. I know. Talk about Sour Pringles. cream and onion.